السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam The religion of Islam has always represented a unique outlook or perspective on God, life, spirituality and moral character making those who embrace its teachings strangers amid the majority who wander aimlessly through the wilderness of their own desires and misguidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reminding him that it is about quality, not quantity. It is about the quality of faith, not the numbers of people that are following you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَإِن تُطِعْ أَكْثَرَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُضِلُّوكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ 
that if you were to obey most of the people, the desires of most of the people on the earth, they would misguide you from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that means to the Prophet sallallahu that the vast majority of people are following their desires, seeking to follow their desires, not willing or not wishing to follow the commandments of God. Most of the people. Which means that there's a small minority from amongst that majority that completely wants to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu at the time when the Muslims were small in number, emerging with a belief system, with uh, uh, an outlook on the world, an outlook on life, an outlook on culture, outlook on God that the world has, hasn't seen or hasn't heard of in a long time. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu if you were to obey most of the people on earth, they would misguide you from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the estrangement or the alienation that the Muslims experience as a result of this is not necessarily an estrangement or an alienation or separation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The strangeness that they experience is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The strangeness that they experience is from a world that is obsessed, that is obsessed with darkness perceived as light. While those who disbelieve are estranged and alienated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they perceive light as darkness which separates them or continues to separate them from the reality of the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse in the Quran reminding the believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter how small you are, you always, you will always be large in number because your protector is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Kabir al-Muta'al, the one who is kabir, the one who is big, the one who is great. How do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is great and we feel like we are a minority? No, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet Ibrahim, وَإِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ كَانَ أُمَّةٍ قَانِتًا لِلَّهِ حَنِيفًا وَلَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ That Ibrahim was an ummah by himself. He's an ummah by himself. Because as the scholars say, إِذَا كُنْتَ أَنْتَ عَلَى الْحَقِّ فَأَنْتَ الْأُمَّةِ That if you are the only one that is on the truth, then you are the ummah. You are the ummah by yourself. Because the ummah is not based upon numbers. It's about sticking closely to the truth. Sticking closely to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but Allah says in this ayah, "Allahu waliyu al-ladina amanu yuhrijuhu min al-dhulumat ila al-nur, wal-ladina kafaru awliyahum al-tawhud yuhrijunahum min al-nur ila al-dhulumat. Ulaika ashab al-nar, hum fiha khalidun." Allah subhanahu wa taala says that Allah is the wali, Allah is the guardian, Allah is the protector, Allah is the friend of those who believe. He brings them out of darkness into light. And those who disbelieve, their awliya. And notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one by himself, he said, Allah alone is the wali of the believers. He is the guardian, the protector, the friend of the believers. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is enough. We don't need anyone else. But when Allah talked about the disbelievers, He said, Awliya'uhum, their guardians and protectors, because as disbelievers, they need more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They require more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but no matter how much they have, it will never be enough for them. Those who disbelieve, their awliya, their guardians and protectors and friends are the ta'ghut, anything that calls you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They bring them from the light to the dark. And these people are from the people of the hellfire, whom fiha khalidun, to dwell therein forever. The strangeness of Islam, brothers and sisters, began with the emergence of Tawheed in the society that was immersed and enmeshed in shirk, idolatry, kufr, disbelief, and jahl, and ignorance of unprecedented levels in all of its forms and manifestations. As the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inna Allah nazara ila ahl al-ardi, fmaqatahum, arabahum, wa ajmahum, illa baqaya min ahl al-kitab." That Allah subhanahu wa taala, before choosing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah looked at everyone on earth and He hated every single one of them. The Arabs from amongst them, and the ajm from amongst them, and the non-Arabs from amongst them. No privilege to anyone during that time, except baqaya, except a small group 
from amongst Ahlul Kitab, from the Jews and the Christians who held on to their, their, their scripture, held on to their doctrine, held on to the teachings of their prophets, but hated everybody on earth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the da'wah of Tawheed to test him with the people and to test the people with him. And so Islam started off strange and alien. And the Islam will return to this stage of being strange and alien as the practice of Islam amongst the Muslims during the last days uh, will be lost. And they will say with their tongues what is not in their hearts. And people will return back to their pre-Islamic practices, which is what we see happening in today's time on levels that we could never have imagined years ago. You find Muslims not having any care or concern with what Allah says, what his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. This is something that we say from our tongues, but our behavior, our character, the way that we conduct our communities, the way that we run our masajid, says something completely different. Says something completely different. People are returning back to their pre-Islamic state of jahiliyyah. And so in our hearts is, you know, different than what we say on our tongues. And we follow our whims and desires instead of knowledge and deep understanding of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Bada al-Islam gharibah wa sayyudu kama bada gharibah. That Islam started off strange and it will return to being strange. Ibn Rajab, he elaborates on how this process happened. I want you to take a listen to this. And I want you to keep in mind everything that is taking place in front of us in today's time. Ibn Rajab, he said, فَلَمَّا بُرِثَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَدْعَى إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ لَمْ يَسْتَجِبْ لَهُ فِي أَوَّلِ الْأَمْرِ إِلَّا وَاحِدْ بَعْدَ وَاحِدْ مِنْ كُلِّ قَبِيلًا Ibn Rajab, he said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Muhammad صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ with the message of Tawheed, the message of Islam, only a few people responded to the message of the Prophet صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ during that time. From every tribe, there might have been one or two people from each and every tribe. One after another from each and every tribe. So there were a small group. And the Muslims during that time, they were weak. Small in numbers, weak. They didn't have any soul. They had no strength. They had no voice. They had nothing. He said, And إلى الحبشة مرتين ثم هاجروا إلى المدينة وكان منهم من يعذب في سبيل الله وفيهم من قتل وكان الداخلون في الإسلام غرباء. He said and the Muslims ran with their religion, fled Mecca, leaving Mecca, going to the area of Abyssinia twice, not once, twice. They fled to Abyssinia the first time. And then they heard that Quraysh had kind of calmed down. And so they returned back to Mecca only to find out that Quraysh was still torturing, still persecuting, still harming the Muslims. So they went back to Abyssinia for a second time, running with their deen, fleeing Mecca with their deen, and then ultimately leaving Mecca, fleeing to Medina. And some from amongst them were tortured, and some from amongst them were killed. And during that time, they were ghurabah, they were strangers. During that time, they were strangers. He said, "Thumma zahr al-Islam بعد الهجرة إلى المدينة وعزة ودخل الناس في دين الله أفواجا." Then, after some time, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave prominence to the religion of Islam. Muslims begin to win wars: the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of Khaybar. They begin winning wars: the Sur al-Hudaybiyah. All of these wars, they begin winning. Islam is starting to spread. People started entering into Islam afwajan, in droves. Islam became popular. And the Prophet ﷺ died while the ummah of his while his ummah was the most mighty and most powerful nation in the Arabian Peninsula during that time. That is how the Prophet Sallallahu left us. And the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu remained like that after that time, all the way up into the two years that Abu Bakr was the Khalifa. 
ثم أعمل الشيطان مكايده على المسلمين. Then Shaytan, after the death of Abu Bakr anhu, then Shaytan began with his plotting and his scheming on the Muslim community. وَأَلْقَى بَأْسَهُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ وَأَفْشَى بَيْنَهُمْ الْفِتْنَةِ فِتْنَةَ الشَّهَوَاتِ وَالشُّبُهَاتِ وَلَمْ تَزِلْ هَاتَانِ فِتْنَةَانِ تَتَزَايَدَانِ شَيْئًا فَشَيْئًا حَتَّى إِسْتَحْكَمَتْ مَكِيدَةِ الشَّيْطَانِ وَأَطَاعَهُ أَكْثَرَ الْخَلْقِ أَكْثَرَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ he said, and then Shaytan started with his plotting and his scheming against the Muslims commu Muslim community. And he began to place between the Muslims an animosity, hatred, fighting, skirmishes that arose between the believers. And two of Shaytan's greatest tools that he used to fragment and separate the Muslim community is the fitna of shahwat and the fitna of shubuhat. The fitna of desires Meaning, your lowly desires, your appetite, your sexual appetite, your appetite for food, which opens the door for all other appetites, and the fitna of shubuhat, the fitna of doubts and misconceptions, misunderstandings of the religion. So the Muslims community begin fragmenting, Shia, Sufi, Maturidi, Fulani, Fulani, Fulani. Every party, every group, every sect, rejoicing at what they believe is with them of the truth. I'm on the truth, you're not on the truth, I'm on the truth, you're not on the truth. And so we fragmented our religion as the Prophet ﷺ prophesied into 73 different sects. All of them will be in the hellfire except one. He said, and these two fitnas, the fitna of shahwat or shubuhat, have continued to increase amongst the Muslim community until the plot and the schemes of Shaytan have fully taken control and most of the Muslims follow either their desires, their lowly desires, their animalistic impulses, or they follow doubts and misconceptions, always missing the target. And Shaytan doesn't care whether you go too far to the left or too far to the right, just as long as you don't, miss your, don't, just as long as you don't hit your target. Shaytan doesn't care. Shahawat, shubuhat, your choice. Just as long as you miss the sirat al-mustaqim. So the few, the few who remain upon what the Prophet Sallallahu left his ummah upon will be a few amongst the many who will have all but abandoned the religion of Al-Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا أَخْشَى عَلَيْكُمْ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَلَّتِي فِي بُطُونِكُمْ وَفُرُوجِكُمْ وَمُضِلَّاتِ الْفِتَنِ the Prophet ﷺ said, the one thing that I fear for my ummah, the thing that I fear most for my ummah is the shahwat, is your lowly desires, the appetite of the stomach and the appetite of the private part. This is the thing that I fear the most. The appetite of the stomach, the butonikum, the appetite of the stomach and the appetite of the private part. The appetite of the stomach is because when you get full, which is one of the reasons that I stress to the brothers and sisters during Ramadan, don't eat until after Salat al But many people go home, you have a big meal, and you never make it back out for the Salat. Because once you fill your stomach, you have no energy, no desire to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the scholars say that if you ever want to complete a task, do it while your stomach is empty. Because once you fill your stomach, forget about it. Forget about it. The scholars, they used to tell us in Medina, That seeking knowledge has been slaughtered by what is between the two legs of the man's wife. Because once you go home to your wife and you enjoy what a man enjoys with his wife, you have no desire to get up at night and study, research, and do exactly what a student of knowledge is supposed to do. And you had and you had many students of knowledge who left the university because they got married. And you had many who left their wives in whatever country they were in because seeking knowledge was the priority. And their wives understood it. So they understood, just like Ibrahim left Hajjah, that they were in that same situation. Go and do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to do. I'll get mine on the back end. They understood the, they understood the mission. But you had many who left the university because I got married, I can't leave my family. And then as a result of that, you lost. 
you lost the opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you to study the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the few who remain upon what the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam left his ummah upon will be a few amongst the many who will have all but abandoned the religion of Islam and they will be the strangers. And the order of it as the scholars say, this will be the second strangeness of Islam. Islam started off strange at the beginning and it will return to being strange towards the last days when many of the Muslims have abandoned Islam or the practice of Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Tuba lil ghuraba, and Jannah is for those who are strangers. Tuba lil ghuraba, glad tidings to the strangers. Tuba lil ghuraba, Jannah for the strangers. The Sahaba radiallahu they wanted clarification for Qalu, Ya Rasulullah, men hum al ghuraba. Who are the ghuraba? Who are the strangers, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he always taught his ummah, gave an explanation. He said, Al ladina yuslihuna id fasad al nas. Wa fi liwayatin qala, qawmun salihun qalilun fi unasin su kathirun. Men ya'asihim akthar min men yuti'uhum. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Al-Ghurba are those, Al-Ladheena yusrihuna idha fasad al-nas. Are those who seek to remain steadfast in the religion and rectify their souls while the vast majority of the people have gone and followed their desires and have become corrupt. Those are the Ghurba. <coughs> while the Muslims are smoking, drinking, partying, on social media, having a ball, Everything is a joke. Everything is funny. And then you have those of us who try to take Islam seriously. And we're criticized for doing so. You're the haram police. You're extreme. You're doing the most. I'm, exactly. I'm doing the most in Islam. That's the one place I would rather do the most. You're doing the most in dunya. You're doing the most in shirk. You're doing the most in kufr. You're doing the most in ma'asiyah. You're doing the most in disobeying, disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what you're doing the most in. I would rather be doing the most in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than be doing the most in obeying shaitan. Pick and choose who you want to do the most for. This is why I don't go to the, the Muslims be doing the most. So what do you want from Islam? What do you want from Islam? Brothers and sisters, ask yourselves, what do you want from this deen? You're going to continue to water down the deen until it coincides with your desires? Now the religion is exactly the way that I want it to be, so now I can be a practicing Muslim in peace? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, do people think that they will be left alone because they say they believe? You think because you say you're a Muslim, you're supposed to have school sailing into Jannah? That's the way that it works. Meanwhile, the Sahaba ajma'in, at the beginning of Islam, there were strangers being tortured for the same deen that we take for granted. The same Aqidah. Bilal was put in the middle of the sun, a boulder put on his chest. Just say that there's more than one God. And he uttered no more than Ahad, Ahad, Allah is one, Allah is one. Tortured for that. Meanwhile, we're sitting here today on our internet and on our social media platforms debating about matters that the Sahaba were tortured and killed for. Well, all of them, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. We're sitting here debating about matters that many of the Sahaba gave up even before it became haram. Many of the Sahaba gave up alcohol even before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it haram. And we're sitting here talking about whether or not it's halal or haram to smoke weed. La ilaha illallah. Bitsama ya'murkum imanukum. Evil is it that your iman, that's your faith? Evil is it what your faith calls you to? Bitsama ya'murkum bihi imanukum. This is what your faith calls you to? This is what Islam calls you to? Subhanallah alameen. What have we done to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Those of you who are strangers, rejoice at being a stranger. Be, rejoice at being called a Muslim who is extreme. Rejoice in being called a Muslim who does the most. And rejoice in being called the haram police. Rejoice because you are a stranger. And the Prophet Wasallam said, Tuba lil ghuraba. And Jannah is for the strangers. The Sahaba said, Men whom ya Rasulullah. Who are the strangers or Messenger of Allah? The Prophet Wasallam said, Al ladina yuslihuna idha fasad al nas. Those who seek to be per those who seek to be pious and righteous, while the vast majority of the people are corrupt and disobedient. 
And another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The Ghurada, the strangers, are people, a righteous group of people. A righteous group of people. Qalilun, who are only a few, a handful. While the vast majority of the people are corrupt. Their souls have been corrupt. Their hearts have been corrupt. Their belief system has been corrupt. And those who follow, those who have rectified themselves and have purified themselves, they're small in number in comparison to the vast majority. So being a minority, brothers and sisters, who stick to the Qur'an and the Sunnah while the vast majority are preoccupied with their desires or misguided doubts and misconceptions qualifies you to be considered a stranger and qualifies you for the promise of Jannah. One of the scholars of the past, Yunus ibn Ubaid, he said, Laysa shay'un, laysa shay'un aghrabu, aghrabu min sunnah wa la aghrabu minha illa min ya'rifuha. He said, there is nothing more strange there is nothing more strange than someone who follows the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu There is nothing more strange than the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and there is nothing more stranger than the sunnah than the people who actually know what the sunnah is. They are the strangest of people. The moment you quote the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu you got Muslims today debating on whether or not I don't take from hadith, that's from the statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La ilaha illallah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam predicted that there would come a time and people would be yastarihuna ala arikatihim, people will be reclining on their couches and they will say, La tuhadithuna bima fi kawlin Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, La tuhadithuna illa, fi, illa bima fi kitab Allah. Baynana wa bayna kitab Allah ibas. Do not narrate to us anything else other than what is in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't want to hear anything else. That's today's time. Reclining on our arika, reclining on our chairs, sitting back on social media, typing on social media about what you follow, what you on, what you're not upon, who's on this, who's on that. From the comfort of your home, from the comfort of your couch, from the comfort of your social media platform. Meanwhile, practice nothing from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nothing. Muslims on social media who talk about the Sahaba as if you're talking about just a regular, regular Muslim in the Muslim community. Hum rijal, kanahlu rijal. They are men just like we're men. Wallahi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when idha dhukira ashabi fa amsiku, that when my companions are mentioned, keep your mouth shut. When my companions are mentioned, keep your mouth shut. He said, for wallahi, the Prophet Sallallahu said that when my companions are mentioned, keep your mouth shut. He said, Wallahi, if you were to give the mountain of Uhud in gold, the sadaqah, it would not amount to a handful of what they gave, not even half. And here we are on social media today talking about the Sahaba as if they are men just like we're men. La ilaha illallah. Died so that we could practice Islam. Died so the aqidah of Islam could be passed on generation to generation while we are here today arguing and debating about whether or not this one was wrong or how we was wrong. I didn't even have thought it was wrong. La ilaha illallah. He said there is nothing more stranger than the sunnah and there is nothing more stranger than the people who actually know the sunnah. Imam Al-Oza'i, another great scholar of hadith, he said, Fi qawli Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bada' al-Islamu gharibaan wa sayyudu kama bada'a. Imam Al-Oza'i commented on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said that Islam began strange and it will return to being strange. Imam Al-Oza'i, he said, Amma innuhu ma yadhabu al-Islam. ولكن يذهب أهل السنة حتى ما يبقى في البلد في في البلد منهم إلا رجل واحد إلا رجل واحد. Imam Ozai said that Islam is not going to disappear. Islam doesn't disappear, but the people of the Sunnah will disappear. The people who uphold the Sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم will disappear حتى ما يبقى في البلد. Until there will be none left in a land or in a city or in a village except one person out of the many people in that village who understands the sunnah, who loves the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and who practices it. 
So the people of Sunnah are the strangers amongst the Muslims who are strangers themselves amongst the vast majority of creation, despite their ignorance of Islam. The vast majority of Muslims are ignorant of Islam. That's a fact. You need to go nowhere except Hajj and Umrah and Tajid Ajib al Ujab, La ilaha illallah. Go to Hajj, go to Umrah, and you will see the ignorance of the Muslim Ummah as a whole. People moving back and forth, not knowing what. What's next? What to do? Where to go? What to do? People throwing shoes at the Jamarah. Rocks. The Prophet Sallallahu said, throw pebbles at the Jamarah. You're throwing a rock this big. Wallah Allah, my last time making Hajj, I seen a woman, an older woman, hitting the face with a rock, blood dripping down her face. Because they have to stone the Jamarah. Ala jahl. On ignorance. Not upon ilm. Not upon sunnah. Upon ignorance of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Uzai said, Ma Islam. Islam is not going to disappear. But the people of the Sunnah will disappear. Until there will not be a left in any city, any given village or city, except one person out of a few. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam listened to this hadith. Almost as if he's talking about our time today. The Prophet sallallahu said, يَدْرُسُ الْإِسْلَامِ يَعْنِي يَذْهَبُ الْإِسْلَامِ يَدْرُسُ الْإِسْلَامِ كَمَا يَدْرُسُ الْوَشْيُ وَشْيُ الثَّوْبِ حَتَّى لَا يُدْرَى مَا سِيَامْ وَلَا الصَّلَاءُ وَلَا نُسُقْ وَلَا حَجْ وَلَا عُمْرَى وَلَا الصَّدَقَةُ وَلَا يُسْرَى عَلَى كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فِي لَيْلَةٍ وَاحِدَةٍ فَلَا يَبْقَى فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْهُ آية. وتبقى طوائف من الناس شيخ كبير وعجوز كبيرة يقولون أدركنا آباءنا على هذه الكلمة يعني لا إله إلا الله فنحن نقولها ولا ولا نعرفها. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that Islam will continue to disappear, meaning the people who uphold the Quran and the Sunnah. Islam will continue to disappear, شيئا فشيئا, little by little, just like the fabric of a thobe wears out over time. You continue to wash your garment, and you can literally see the fabric disappearing. With each and every wash, you'll find that the fabric is getting thinner and thinner and thinner until there's a hole in it, meaning the fabric has worn out. Islam will wear out just like that. He said, until there will be people amongst the Muslim community, they don't even know what siyam is, they don't know what fasting is, they don't know what salat is, they don't know what hajj is, they don't know what umrah is, they don't know what sadaqah is, and the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be lifted from the earth in one night. Can you imagine waking up the next morning and there's no mushaf? So let me show you, let me show you the starting process to that. Most masajid have taken the physical mushafs out of the masjid. Why? Because people come into the masjid and you're on your phone. So no more Qur'ans in the masjid. I've gone into masjids and you're like, well, where are the musahif at? Where are no mushafs in the masjid? Only a few. It's not a shelf full of mushafs where you can just go and grab one and sit down and read. Most people walk in because your phone is convenient and you take out your phone and you start reading Qur'an from your phone. So what happens when we stop printing Qur'ans, physical copies of the Qur'an, because we don't necessarily need the physical copies anymore because we got them on our phones? And then what happens, like what happened a couple of weeks ago when social media is no longer working and all of the Qur'an that we had was on the phone? Then what? And then there's only a handful of people who have memorized the whole Qur'an from amongst us. You got who follow the Qur'an even in Ramadan that are reading from the Mus'haf instead of reading from their memory. That's where we are at today. That's where we are at today. People who have memorized the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dying because the Muslim community is so busy with their dunya, so business, so busy with their dunya, we don't have time to memorize Quran. Even students in the university, well, Allah, we were in the university, and a popular question that used to be posed to many of the mashaykh is how are we going to memorize the Quran and we have studies? We, we, you got university studies. La ilaha illallah. If you didn't do anything else except memorize the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if you failed and you went home and you didn't graduate with a degree, but you memorized the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, najat, you are successful. You are successful. Wallah al when I went to the Islamic university, I didn't want to go to the university. I just wanted to memorize the Quran. That's it. I wanted to sit at the feet of someone who had an ijazah, from someone who had an ijazah, all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ so that I could have that link 
to connect me to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But in today's time, many Muslims are too busy, even in Ramadan, when you have nothing but time, too busy to sit down and read the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The Qur'an will be lifted from the earth in one night. حَتَّى لَا يَبْقَى فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْهُ آيَةٍ And there will not be one verse from the Qur'an left amongst the Muslims. And although we have the physical Qur'an, physical Qur'an here today, let the average Muslim get into a debate with one another and see if you can reach into the Qur'an. 6,323 ayah. See if you can reach into the book of Allah and pull out an ayah to support your claim. We're quick to yell, something is halal, something is haram. Show me in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where it's halal and haram. What is she? What is she? Tarakuhu wara al-zuhurina. We have left the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tossed it behind our backs. Now we argue and debate today based upon what this shaykh said, what this medhat said, what this alam said, what this fulat. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? What does Allah say? Subhanallah, what does Allah say? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yaday Allahi wa rasooli. Oh, you who believe, do not put yourselves forward before Allah and His Messenger. Allah and His Messenger come first, meaning before we make a decision, before we get into the debate, have your ayah, your hadith prepared to support your claim. And that's the basic, that should be the standard in our ummah. Wallah al I got to Saudi Arabia as a student, I'm, a, I'm in a cab with a cab driver. Cab driver asked me how much of Quran I've memorized. I said, you know, just a few, I'm a new student. I asked him, how much you memorize? You memorize the whole Qur'an? And he just, you know, shook his head, said, you know, inshallah. Half of Qur'an is not going to put himself out there like that. And I asked him, could you recite some Qur'an for me? And he said, you want me to recite? He said, I said, yeah, I want you to recite some Qur'an. This is a cab driver. And he starts to recite from Surah al Maryam. SubhanAllah Adim, I'm sitting in the back seat of the cab crying. Because this is a cab driver. Half of Kitab We're sitting here, got so much to say about Islam and how much Islam we on and what we on and what this person is doing, what this person is not doing, who's going to hell, who's going to Jannah, right? Who's a Mubtaqir, who's an innovator, who's Ahl Sunnah? But you come to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is she? Sad. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be removed from the earth in one night. There will not be one verse from the Qur'an left. He said, and tabqa tawa'if min nas And there will be, you know, just a group of the Muslims that will be left around. An old man, an old woman. And they will say that our parents used to say this phrase all the time. And we don't necessarily know what it means, but we just repeat the phrase that we heard our parents say. You know the phrase that they're talking about? The phrase they're talking about is la ilaha illallah. They don't even know what it means. They know that their parents used to say it, but they don't actually really know what it actually means. This is how Islam will end up. This is the path that we are on today, creating this type of path. You go to the average Muslim and you ask them, what does la ilaha illallah mean? You'll say there's no God but Allah. That, that definition, that understanding of la ilaha illallah does not go past the Eid al that, would, that understanding would not even enter you into the fold of Islam. That understanding of Islam is no different than Shaytan's belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is God. There's no God but Allah. That's not the meaning of la ilaha illallah. La ma'bud bi haqqin illallah. There is no deity, no God, no system that deserves worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Completely different understanding. But that just shows our burden, our distance from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, I'm not here to shame or blame or make anyone feel any type of way. I'm here to make you think about the way that you view your religion, the way that you practice your religion today. If that makes you uncomfortable, don't blame me, blame you. Don't say, I don't like the way the shape talks. I don't like men. That's, that's your personal feelings. You feel uncomfortable because I said something that makes you look at yourself differently. That is my job. My job is to make you uncomfortable. My job is to make you think about the way that you are practicing your religion. Rethink how you're approaching is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Not to walk out of here saying, oh, mashallah, that was a good khutbah. I feel so good, mashallah. And then go back into your happy life and continuously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ajib, you go to some khutbahs, you go to some masajid, and the imam just talking for 30 minutes, making you feel good. It's almost like sitting in front of a Christian preacher. Making you feel good. You walk away out, no, mashallah, go to a restaurant, go sit down. And, no, I want you to go home and cry. Because I gave you something to think about. Go home and start questioning yourself. Man, am I a hypocrite? I'm walking away from this khutbah feeling like maybe I'm not doing something right. I need to rethink how I'm practicing Islam. My approach to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, we are sitting on gold, sitting on this deen, and not doing anything with it. But they will know, la ilaha illallah, that because their parents used to say it, but they will not actually even know what it means. Hudayfa, who's the narrator of this hadith, another sahabi said to him as he heard Hudayfa narrating this hadith, فَقِيلَ لِحُذَيْفَ مَا يُغْنِي عَنْهُمْ قَوْلَ لَا إِلَهَا إِلَى اللَّهُ وَهُمْ لَا يَعْرِفُونَهَا وَلَا يَعْرِفُونَ الصَّلَاءُ وَلَا الزَّكَاءُ وَلَا الصِّيَامُ وَلَا عَجْ He said this three times to Hudayfa. He said, Hudayfa, what will La ilaha إِلَى اللَّهُ do for these people during that time when they don't even know what it means? What will La ilaha إِلَى اللَّهُ do for these people during that time when they don't even know what it means? They don't know what salat is. They don't know what zakat is. Well, Allah, then you go to Muslim, go to some Muslim countries, countries where Muslims are at, they don't actually even know how to pray. They don't even pray. I'm not going to call any countries out because I don't want anybody that's here that's from those places to feel some type of way. But you know as well as I know. I've traveled the Muslim world for many years. Muslim, don't pray. They have no idea what salat is. They don't know the pillars of salat. They don't know the shurut of salat. They don't know the conditions of salat. They don't know anything. Fasting, yeah, you know, my parents used to fast, but they don't know anything about fasting. This is happening right now in our time. We're living in this time right now. You got Muslims right here in America, born and raised Muslim. Don't fast, don't pray, don't even know what la ilaha illallah means. Many of them went to Islamic schools and in two years, three years into high school, two years into college, forgot everything. <clears throat> Parents spent all of this money putting them into Islamic school. The only thing you did was protect them from public school. But they didn't learn Islam. <clears throat> because two years into high school, Islam out the window. What was it all worth? SubhanAllah al man. Who they thought was asked, how are these people going to be benefited by la ilaha illallah when they don't even know what it means? They don't know what salat is, they don't know what zakat is, they don't know what fasting is. How can this benefit them? Who they thought didn't say anything. It's quiet. He said it again. Who they thought, how can la ilaha illallah benefit these people when they don't know what it means? And he asked for a third time. And who they thought turns to him and he says, Tunjihim min al-nadi, tunjihim min al-nadi. He said, La ilaha illallah is enough to save them from the hellfire. La ilaha illallah is enough to save them from the hellfire. As I mentioned in the hadith during Ramadan, in my last khutbah here, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go to the hellfire and pull out anyone who says La ilaha illallah, even if they don't understand what it means. That's how powerful La ilaha illallah is. But look at what these people will have done to themselves during that time because they didn't understand. Although it will save you from the hellfire, it will not save you from, you know, the hell that you're going to catch on earth because you don't understand what it means. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness for our shortcomings. رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ أَلَّهُمَّ إِنَّا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَّا لَمِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ يَا ذَا الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ وَنَفَعَنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِمَا جَاءَ فِيهِ مِنَ الْآيَاتِ وَالذِّكْرِ الْحَكِيمِ أَقُولُ مَا تَسْمَعُونَ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَائِرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ ذَنْبٍ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك لا إخرارا به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله سراج منيرا أما بعد 
Brothers and sisters in Islam, what we see happening today is the disappearance of Islamic traditions, largely stemming from a lack of knowledge that is rooted in a lack of concern for Islam, except for the proclamation of being Muslim. Many Muslims are just concerned with saying that I'm Muslim, and some even shy away and are even afraid to acknowledge that they are Muslim in front of others. Afraid? How are you afraid to say you are Muslim? How? How are you afraid to give another Muslim salams in front of your non-Muslim colleagues or your non-Muslim employer because you, you don't want to have to go back with them and have that conversation? Oh, you're a Muslim? I didn't know you were a Muslim. You don't want to have, that's an uncomfortable conversation for somebody who never practiced Islam in front of them. Especially if those non-Muslims know what Islam is and knows how to distinguish a real Muslim from a not so real Muslim. That's a difficult conversation. So you just play it off like I'm not Muslim, I'm not going to say anything. Many of our children ashamed to go to school and let everybody know that they're Muslim until Ramadan comes around and then everybody comes out of the closet with their Islamic attire. Making, making a mockery of the religion because it's only like, all right, I'm Muslim only during Ramadan. Then right after Ramadan is over, it's back to being who you were. Non-Muslims know that that's not the correct way to represent a religion. We are the only ones that live in our own delusion, thinking that, you know, we're practicing Islam even if it's just for Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of all months, not the month of Ramadan. But what we see happening, you know, is a very selfish and individualistic approach to Islam because it shows a lack of concern for passing Islam on to the next generation. If this is what we're doing with Islam while we're here, how in the world are we going to pass Islam on to the next generation? The Sahaba, they were concerned with passing Islam on to the next generation to make sure that this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their loyalty was to Islam, their allegiance was to Islam. I want to see this deen grow. I want to see this deen become successful. You know how you create a business. Many of you are entrepreneurs. You created a business, brick and mortar, from the ground up. And you put your work in. You put your hard-earned work into it. You know, your hard-earned money, your work, your, you know, put everything into it. You don't just, after I'm gone, just let the, the business collapse. You're going to pass that on to your children. You're going to make sure that you teach your children the business so you can pass that on to them so that that family name can continue on. Why don't we do the same thing with Islam? Because our concern is not for Islam. Our concern, we're selfish. Many of us are business owners. We put more into our business than we do to Islam. We put more into creating this business and making sure that this business has creates generational wealth amongst our progeny. But we don't do the same thing with Islam. When the Prophet asked Abu Bakr when he dumped a bag of dinars, gold and silver coins in front of the Prophet as Sabaka, the Prophet asked Abu Bakr, Mada tarakta li ahli? What did you leave for your family, Abu Bakr? And Abu Bakr said, Taraktu li ahli Allah wa Rasulah. I left my family, Allah, and his messenger. Many of us, we have insurance, life insurance, death insurance, all types of insurance because we want to make sure our families are straight if we're gone. What of Islam have you left for your family? And specifically for the men, because we are the imams of our homes. We are the leaders in the Muslim community. But what are you leaving behind for your children? How much of Islam do your children know? Abu Bakr who was a businessman, but he didn't mix business with pleasure. The pleasure of the Prophet Sallallahu eye was in Islam, in the Salat. He said, Ju'ina qurra ta'ani for Salat. The pleasure, my pleasure, is in the prayer. I don't find joy in anything else in this dunya other than my prayer. But here we are mixing business with pleasure and leaning more towards the business than we do the pleasure with Islam. SubhanAllah we're leaving our children the house, we're leaving them the car, we're leaving them the business, we're leaving them the money, the bank accounts, the offshore accounts, leaving them everything, the life insurance policy, mashallah, waladeen in sight. Because we don't care about Islam being passed on. We don't care about Islam enduring beyond our years. Regardless of how much the Prophet ﷺ has promised us, that if you convey from me one ayah and someone learns that ayah, then you get the reward for it. Whoever builds a house for the sake of Allah, then Allah will build for you a mansion in paradise. We don't care about none of those hadith. 
Because our concern is business, money, making money, making sure my family not broke, making sure that I leave my family some money. How about leaving your family Allah and his messenger? How about leaving your family Allah and his messenger? And it starts small. That doesn't mean that our children have to be scholars. But our children should have enough iman, enough faith to resist the temptations that are out here in this dunya. This dunya is slaughtering our children. Muslim children are being slaughtered even after this investment that we make in putting them into Islamic school, only to put them in Islamic school from pre-K all the way to eighth grade, and they get into high school, and in two years of being in high school, they return being worse than a dispute. What was it all worth? All of that investment for what? And part of the reason that that happens is because while we're putting all of this money into sending them to Islamic school, we don't we don't show them that we actually value Islam through our own actions. Their parents who come pick their children up from school blasting music. I even come to an Islamic school to pick their kids up blasting music. Their kids walking out of Quran class to get into your car while your car smells like weed. Your car is blasting with music after they just came from Quran class. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. The message that we're sending is that Islam, you know, I'm putting you in Islamic school, but I don't, I don't really care about Islam. That's the message that we're sending. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. The way we talk, the profanity that we use, the lack of adab that we use in front of our children, yet we're paying for them to go to Muslim school. For what? For what? It's a waste of your money. Children are not paying attention to what you say. They're paying attention to what you do. They don't care about what you say. What do you do? How often do you pick your children up from Islamic school and say, teach me something that you learned in Islamic studies today. Teach me an ayah or a surah that you learned today. Even if you know it, but you want to be the, the student in that moment and let your child be the teacher in that moment. The same way Andrew Jibreel did with the Sahaba, with the Prophet Sallallahu when he came and asked the Prophet a bunch of questions. He put the Prophet Sallallahu in a student position, even though the Prophet Sallallahu knew the answers, so that the Sahaba could learn. It's a teaching strategy, cheating method. So in ending, brothers and sisters, we pass on the next, pass Islam on to the next generation by holding on to the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ يُمَسِّكُونَ بِالْكِتَابِ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ إِنَّ لَا نُضِيعُوا أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِلِحِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed those who hold on, you must sikuna bil kitab, they hold on to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa aqamu salah, and they establish the salah. Then indeed we will not cause the reward of the Muslim, those who are Muslim, those who seek to be righteous, we will not cause your reward to be wasted. The Prophet sallallahu said to the Sahaba, in the kum fi zaman, in the ulama'ukum kathir, wa khutaba'ukum qaleel. وَمَنْ تَرَكَ مِنْكُمْ عُشْرًا عُشْرًا مِمَّا يَعْلَمْ فَقَدْ هَوَى أو في رواية فَقَدْ هَلَكْ وَسَيَأْتِي عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ يَقِلُّ عُلَمَاؤُهُمْ وَيُكْثِرُ خُطَبَاؤُكُمْ خُطَبَاؤُهُمْ مَنْ تَمَسَّكَ فِيهِ بِعُشْرًا وَبِعُشَيْرٍ مِمَّا يَعْلَمْ فَقَدْ نَجَى The Prophet said to the Sahaba that you all are living in a time where your ulama, your scholars, are many. Well, khutaba'ukum and your preachers and people who run off at the mouth are few. Scholars are many. And the people who talk are few. He said, but if you were to leave off one-tenth of Islam, you would be destroyed. He said, but there's going to come a time upon the people where their khutaba, their speakers and preachers will be many. Where their ulama, their scholars will be few. And even if they held on to a tenth of Islam, they would be successful. Are we even holding on to a tenth of Islam? Just a tenth of the religion. I want to leave you, there's so much more I have to say, but I'm always pressed for time. I want to leave you with this quote from Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, as I leave. He said, Qala Ibn Qayyim, Sammu. Uh, or sumu al-ghurabah 
فإن أكثر الناس على غير هذه الصفات يعني صفات الغرباء. He said the reason why they are called غرباء, the reason why they are called strangers, is because the vast majority of the people we're talking about Muslims here, the vast majority of the people during that time will not meet those qualifications that the Prophet ﷺ gave us of those who are strangers. He said, for Ahlul Islam, for Nas Ghurabat. He said, so the Muslim community as a whole are strangers amongst the vast majority of Allah's creation. So as Muslims, by default of being a Muslim, you are a stranger amongst the vast majority of people who are not Muslims. He said, well, mu'minun fi Ahlul Islam Ghurabat. And the believers from amongst the Muslims are strangers. Because not every Muslim is a mu'min, but every mu'min is a Muslim. You understand? Not everybody who says they are Muslim are believers. How do we know that? Because you had hypocrites during the time of the Prophet ﷺ who said that they were believers. And they were not believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدِعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ From amongst mankind are those who say they believe in Allah in the last day. They believe in Allah in the last day. And they're not believers. I don't care what they say. Not every mu'min, not every Muslim is a mu'min. Everybody who says that they're Muslim is not a believer. Some people just took shahada. Some people just acknowledge Islam is the truth. That doesn't mean that Iman has crept into their hearts yet. But every believer is a Muslim. So the believers amongst the Muslims are ghuraba, are strangers. He said, "Wa ahlul ilm fil mu'minin, ahlul ilm ghuraba fil mu'minin." And from amongst the believers, the people of knowledge amongst the believers are ghuraba, are strangers amongst the believers, because not every believer has knowledge. There's some people who are good worshippers, but ignorant worshippers. They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon ignorance. Abdullah bin Abbas, he went to go debate with the Khawarij, the same people who said that Abu Bakr was a kafir. They went to go debate with the, Abdullah bin Abbas went to go debate with the Khawarij, the same people who were responsible for killing Ali bin Abi Talib and said, Ali bin Abi Talib, if he's not Amir al-Mu'mineen, he's Amir al-Kafirin. If Ali bin Abi Talib is not the leader of the believers, then he's the leader of the disbelievers. What jahl, what ignorance. Ali bin Abi Talib refused to call himself Amir al-Mu'mineen ala tawadhar, humbling himself. I'm not Amir al-Mu'mineen. I'm the Khalifa. I'm the leader of the Muslims. But I refuse to carry that title of Amir al-Mu'mineen out of humility. And these extreme Muslims said, well, if he's not the leader of the believers, then he's the leader of the disbelievers. Call him a kafir. Abdullah bin Abbas went to go debate with them. He said, لَمَّا دَخَلْتُ عَلَيْهِمْ When I entered into the area where these individuals were, I could hear the murmuring of Qur'an. They were reading the Qur'an. And I could see on their foreheads prostration marks because these were people of ibadah. These are not fusaq. These are not sinful individuals. These are people, extremely religious people. He said, وَمَا رَأَيْتُ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا He said, but I didn't see any of the sahaba from amongst them. Meaning they were ignorant. Juhal. How are you reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the people who the Qur'an was revealed to is not from amongst you, not amongst you teaching you. Ignorant worshippers. The point that I'm making is that the people of knowledge from amongst the believers, people who have knowledge of the deen from amongst the believers, they are ghuraba, they are strangers. He said, wa ahlu sunnah min ahlul ilm ghuraba. And the people of the Sunnah, from amongst the people who have knowledge, from amongst the believers, from amongst the Muslims, they are even stranger, the people of the Sunnah. So as you can see with each and every line, what Ibn Qayyim is attempting to do is to show us that when you feel a strangeness amongst the Muslims, nine times out of ten, it all depends on where your level is within the religion. If you're a learned person, then you feel lonely. <laughs> I, I promise you. 
You're a person of the sunnah that has knowledge of the deen. There is no more loneliness beyond that. Because you're surrounded by the vast majority of people who are ignorant of the religion, unfortunately. And will attack you as a result of their ignorance. He says, so the people of knowledge from amongst the believers are strangers, and the people of the sunnah from the people of the people of knowledge are even more stranger. And the people who call to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are patient with the harm that they receive from the ignorant from amongst them, there is no greater ghurba, there is no greater strangeness than that. Because not every person who has knowledge, not every person who has a sunnah, has the ability to call people to Islam. So the person that is calling people to Islam and is patient with the harm that they receive in the process of that, they are the most severely tested people when it comes to the strangeness. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst the strangers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those people who hold on to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam despite what others think. Brothers and sisters, this is not a game of how many people. This is about holding on to what you believe is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if the entire world goes against you. Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, I will fight anyone who refuses to pay zakat as they used to pay zakat during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And many of the Sahaba went against him. Abu Bakr went against him. Uh, Umar went against him. How are you going to fight people who say, La ilaha illallah? Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, Wallahi, lo mina'uni iqalim. Kano yu addu ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lahu qatim al-law. Walau bi wahdi. He said, I swear by Allah, if they were to deny me an iqal, something as simple as an iqal, which is the, the black thing that many of the Arabs that wear a gutra, that black thing, that circle thing that they wear on their head, that's called an iqal. Right? Use it to put it around the knee of the camel to keep the camel down. Right? He said, if they deny me something as insignificant as that, that they used to give to the Prophet as a zakat, I will fight every single one of them, even if I got to do it by myself. Understand? That is the type of energy that we are looking for amongst the Muslim community today. And that cannot happen, brothers and sisters, without two things. Knowledge of the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and an increase in Iman. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbana zidna ilman. Allahumma ya Rabbana zidna ilman. Oh Allah, increase us in knowledge. Allahumma zidna ilman wa amalan. Oh Allah, increase us in knowledge and in action. فَإِنَّكَ وَلِيُّ ذَلِكَ وَقَادِرٌ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى نَبِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمَ تَسْلِيمًا كَثِيرًا وَسُبْحَانَكَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ أَمَّا يَسِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ <تصفيق> حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح 